All right, everybody, uh, in this lesson, part two of lesson B, we're going to branch out on the topics that we covered in part one. We talked specifically about domain, graphically, and then we looked a little bit at piecewise functions and some other properties. In this lesson, we're going to focus on how to find the domain of a function algebraically, as well as taking the idea of a piecewise function and graphing it. Let's go ahead and get started. As mentioned in uh, part one of lesson B, the domain of a function can be implied. It can be explicitly uh, defined or it can be implied, meaning that we must find it either graphically or algebraically. So <clears throat> in part one, we graphically found or observed by inspection what the domain would be of a function. Today, we're going to algebraically do this process. Uh, specifically, there are two cases you must be careful uh, when looking at a function to determine algebraically what the domain of the function is. The two uh, cases that you want to look at are, am I dividing at some point by zero? And the second one is, am I evaluating an even root of a negative number? So, <clears throat> for example, if I have a function, let's call it f of t, and it's 10 divided by t squared. Would there possibly be a value that I could plug in for t such that I'd be dividing by 0? And in this case, I would, uh, I would have a 0. If t equals 0, we would be dividing by 0. That would be a problem. Our calculator doesn't like that, and we would have an issue. So we're going to use that uh, case as well as the second case, which is evaluating an even root of a negative number. So an even root could be a square root, uh, and this function inside could be x plus 3 or it could be written as x plus 3 to the 1 half. Uh, these are all examples <clears throat> of even roots, right? Here's another one, the fourth root of x to the ninth, etc. Therefore, we don't ever want to take an even root of a negative number. That number doesn't exist. You might have seen that some in the higher algebra course you've taken where the imaginary unit shows up, i. Okay, we don't want that to happen because we're dealing only with real numbers. Okay, so we want this root to be even in order to have this restriction. So let's determine the domain of the functions given below. Okay, let's start with f of x. Uh, f of x is x to the one half power. That's equivalent to saying that f of x equals the square root of x. Now we know that we have a restriction on the domain if we have an even root, and that's an even root. That is the square root. Therefore, we want this expression on the inside to be greater than or equal to zero. I can take the square root of zero. I can take the square root of any positive number. Therefore, I want x to be greater than or equal to zero. And in that case, you have found the domain of f of x. If x is greater than or equal to zero, the function, the square root of, f, or the square root of x does exist. Here's what the square root of x looks like. We're going to talk about this in one of the following sections here. But that's what the function f of x looks like. And clearly, the inputs are x greater than or equal to 0. All right, let's take a look at g of x next to it. OK, I'm going to rewrite g of x in a form that shows an even root. Okay, It does in the form it is now, but I want to write it in a more familiar form to you. Oops, that's a minus 5. Okay, again, what I want is this item. It's called the radicand. I'll write that out here. Radicand. I want the radicand to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so I'm going to take 2x minus 5. And I'm going to set it greater than or equal to 0, which means 2x would be greater than or equal to 5, which means x would be greater than or equal to 5 halves. Now I know my domain for this function, the domain of g of x is x greater than or equal to 5 halves. Now if you wanted to use a different form, for example, a form like this, this is interval notation, that would also work. So the domain of g of x could be written in either of those two forms. Okay, let's move on to the next example, m of x. Okay, so m of x. Uh, 
thinking about our two restrictions, is there an even root? And the answer to that is no. This is not an even root. This is x squared. It's a form of a quadratic. Okay. Am I ever possibly going to divide by 0? The answer to that is no as well because there is no denominator. Right? The denominator here is 1. Therefore, the domain of m of x is all real numbers. Okay. Uh, there is no restriction here. No square root, no fourth root, no sixth root, no even root, nor am I possibly going to divide by 0 in any case. Okay, here's a good example. Uh, this is an even root, the 1 -sixth power. Not a uh, very uh, orthodox way to look at uh, this type of function, but we have the sixth root of 9 minus s. And again, that radicand, I want to be greater than or equal to 0. Don't forget greater than or equal. Okay, therefore, negative s will be greater than or equal to negative 9. And remember, with uh, these inequalities, when I change the sign, i got to flip the inequality symbol. Therefore, the domain of m of s is s less than or equal to 9. Okay, let's move on to the next example. Okay, here I've got an example where I don't have an even root, but I do have a denominator that could possibly equal 0. So I'm going to rewrite this in a form that's a little bit more uh, pleasing to the eye. And I want the denominator to never equal 0. I don't want it to equal 0. So i got to find out where it does equal 0. So if t minus 7 equals 0, then t equals 7 is when, h, or when the denominator would equal 0. I don't want that to be the case. I don't want t to equal 7. Therefore, the domain of h of t is t cannot equal 7. That means it could equal any other number other than 7. Um, another way that I could write this domain, of course, using interval notation, would be that t is part of the set from negative infinity up to 7, but not including 7. That's what the parentheses instead of brackets is used for. And then from 7 to infinity. Now you can see that I've got a gap here, right? But uh, represented by this u. That's the uh, union of those two sets. Okay, so that means that any number other than 7, you can kind of think of this as a di dividing value that breaks that up into two sets. Okay, I can get really, really close to 7, but can never equal 7. We're going to talk about that in further chapters. Okay, last example. Um, it looks like I have a rational function, v of r, Rational meaning it's a ratio, okay, 3 over t plus 3 squared. And again, I don't want the denominator to equal 0. Therefore, the only way that the denominator could equal 0 is if t equals negative 3. I don't want that to be the case. Therefore, the domain of v of r is going to be t not equal to negative 3. Okay, again, in interval notation, oops, I keep putting equal signs there, sorry, would be from negative infinity to negative 3, and then from 3 off to infinity. That's how we find the domain of functions that have possibly one or two restrictions based on am I dividing by 0 at any point, and is there an even root? present. All right, let's move on to graphing piecewise function. So I got ahead of myself a little bit. We're not graphing piecewise until after this slide, but I want to determine the domain of the following functions. A couple interesting situations here. Um, here for t of x, I've got the absolute value of 4 minus x plus 5. Now, there are no restrictions on this. There's no even root. We're not dividing by anything. Therefore, our domain of t of x would be all real numbers. Okay. No absolute value will ever have any restrictions on the domain unless it's got some kind of rational division or even root involved in it. Okay, R of t. Let's look at the next one. R of t is the square root. Let me rewrite. My math type isn't working properly, so I had to write it in this unconventional form. Okay, So R of t is the square root of 25 minus t squared. What I want is for the inside, right, that radicand, 
to be greater than or equal to zero. Now this is an interesting situation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve for t squared. So I'd have negative t squared is greater than or equal to negative 25. And then when I change the sign, I'm gonna flip that inequality. Okay, so when is t squared less than or equal to 25? Well, t squared will be less than or equal to 25 when t is between the following values, negative five and five. You could look at that graphically. If I graph t squared, here's the graph of t squared. Well, when would t squared be less than or equal to 25? Well, it would be, in this case, less than 25. Let me give you a horizontal line here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. This portion of the graph right here is less than or equal to 25 when x is between negative 5 and positive 5. Therefore, the domain of r of t is x between, oops, I should say t. Sometimes I get my independent variables mixed up. Between those values of negative 5 and 5. Okay, now I do want to put this in interval notation as well. The interval notation for this is much cleaner, much nicer. Notice the square brackets. That means inclusive of the ends. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting problem. You're going to see a couple of those in your practice problem set. Okay. Here is a function, w of y, in which you're going to see both restrictions take place. Um, so as I look at this, I see an even root right, right there as well as I see a function in the denominator that could equal zero. So not only do I want uh, y minus five, the square root of y minus five cannot equal zero, but I also want y minus five to be greater than or equal to zero. So I have those two items going on here. Now, as I look at the first equation, that means I want y minus five to not equal zero. That means y cannot equal five. Oops, that was a poor five. I don't want y to equal five because that would make the denominator, denominator equal zero. I also want y minus five to be greater than or equal to zero. That means I want y to be greater than or equal to five. Now we have a problem here. Look, I, I'm being told that I want y to be greater than or equal to five, but I'm also being told that y can't equal five. So I have to consider both situations when I write the domain of w of y. If I want y to be greater than or equal to 5, but it can't equal 5, then y is just going to be greater than 5. Oops, I'm sorry. Yep, that's right. I get in the habit of thinking y is the uh, dependent variable, but in this case it's independent. Now I could write that again in interval notation, which would just be 5 to infinity. Notice, again, parenthesis, no bracket, because it's not inclusive of that endpoint. Okay, let's move on to one more example, d of t. All right, so we have to determine, do we have any sort of rational function where I could divide by zero? The answer to that is no. Do I have an even root? The answer to that is yes. One-fourth power is an even root. I'm going to rewrite d of t as the fourth root of t squared plus 3t. Looks like I put an x there. Should have been a t. Okay. And since I don't have a restriction in the denominator, all that I need is for this expression, t squared plus 3t, to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. This is a really interesting problem, and this is kind of taking a step forward within the area of difficulty. But I'm going to factor this. And in some cases, you might remember how to graph this. Uh, in other cases, what I would say is let's find the values just for a moment where this is equal to zero. Since I've got it in factored form, I can find that. Okay, I would know that this function is equal to zero when t equals zero and when t equals negative three. So if I were to sketch, generally speaking, uh, this function t squared plus 3t, let's put this right here, then I know that it would be equal to 0 at 0, 
And at, oops, I didn't want that. Let's go negative three here and uh, zero there. So I could test around it to see where the function is greater than or equal to zero. Now what you'll notice is if you did test it and you were to sketch this graph, it would look like this, okay? And I know that because this quadratic is gonna open upward. Why? Because there's a positive one in front of it, in front of that leading coefficient. So it's gonna open upward. And the only way it could go through those two points, negative three and zero, is if it passed through at both of those points. Therefore, if I want that to be greater than or equal to zero, I need to find the x values for which this graph is greater than or equal to zero. So I could say that the domain of d of t is from negative infinity up to and including negative three. That's designated by this inequality here with being equal to zero as well as well as from zero to infinity. Now let's analyze this here real quick. Negative three is where the function comes down to and equals zero, right? So from negative infinity all the way over here to negative three, all these values, these outputs are positive, greater than or equal to zero, okay? Then we jump this gap, right? Because in this gap, the function is less than zero. And then we pick back up at zero inclusive there with the square bracket off to x equals infinity all outputs up to infinity will then be positive okay let's graph a piecewise function on the next slide i believe i am correct this time okay here we go uh as seen before we saw this in uh, part one but we were just evaluating the piecewise function right so we wanted to know h of two or h of negative five etc but in the following situation, we're gonna plot h of t and v of t on the graphs provided, labeling at least five ordered pairs on both graphs. Okay, so what I want to bring to your attention is that I have changed the restriction on the certain parts of the function. So h of t has two parts of, to its function, t squared plus one when t is less than zero, t, uh, two t plus one when t is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so I got a linear portion, I got a quadratic portion. That's the same in v of t. However, I have changed the values for the domain on each part of the function. Okay, notice now that that splitting point is negative two. Let's see what happens here as I graph, okay? So let's graph, uh, first let's graph t, 2t plus one. Okay, that's a line with a slope of two and a y-intercept of one. So I'm gonna go right here, one, two, three, four, five. We're gonna call that five. We're gonna do the same scale here on the other coordinate axes. That'll be five. So if I have a y-intercept of one and a slope of two, notice that this is at t equals zero, and a slope of two, this would be another point on that line. It would look like this. Notice how I have a closed circle here. That's because it's inclusive at zero on this function. It does not extend to the left of zero because this is only for t greater than or equal to zero. Okay, for t squared plus one, that's a quadratic that is shifted up one unit. So I'm gonna actually graph this piece in blue. So at t equals zero, which it doesn't include, I'm gonna put an open circle there. And then a quadratic function has this interesting pattern of change. It'll go over one, up one, then over one, up three. So x squared plus one should look kind of like that. Okay, now let's look at v of t. This is a complete piecewise function. I did want to label five points, so I'm gonna do that. Here's the point zero one. Here's the point one three. Uh, here is the point negative one, positive two. And here is the point negative two, positive five. Okay, I don't have five points there, so let's get one more. This point up here, right near this arrow on the linear function uh, would end up being two comma five. Okay, I got myself five points.
Okay, so if you think about V of t, what has happened is that I've shifted the intersection, or at least that, that point where the domain changes for one and picks up for the other. Okay, so I'm going to draw the exact same line. Okay, keeping the axes the same. Okay, so that's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. Okay, and then we could go down, but I don't believe we're going to end up needing it based on these graphs. Okay, so let's look at, I'll graph 2t plus 1 in green. Okay, so we knew that it went through 1, then it went through 1, 3, then it went through 2, 5. Okay, so nothing changed there. However, we're now going to t all the way back to t equals negative 2. So if I put a little backwards planning here into effect, my line now extends all the way back to this point. Notice the open circle, excuse me, the closed circle right here due to the fact that t is greater than or equal to 2. All right, now, you're going to notice that now these graphs are not connected. I'm going to graph t squared plus 1 in yellow. Okay, so I'm going to first start with this. I know that the center of t squared plus 1, right, the axis of symmetry, which we'll talk about later, is at 0 because the function hasn't been shifted left or right. So I'm not going to see, like, that nice bottom portion, what we call the vertex. Okay, at negative 2, what did we say? We had 5. Wow. Okay, so at negative 2, we had this portion of the graph, right, which is technically on the original, just that. Okay, so I'm not seeing the rest of the graph right there. Okay, so you can see how when I change the domains, that changes the overall shape of those two graphs. Now I did make one mistake here. I should have had an open circle here. And the reason for that is because clearly it's not equal there. You can't have two closed circles because then we won't have a function because there will be two uh, outputs for the same input. Okay, so we're gonna have an open circle on the yellow graph, closed circle on the green graph. That's how it'll always work with piecewise functions. There's a gap, jumps, and there might be two gaps. It's okay too, okay? Um, but that's how you go ahead and you graph a piecewise function. That's it for part two on lesson B. Uh, make sure you do both part one and part two practice problems. All right, have a great day.